Hi, everyone. If you're joining us right now, we're just going to give it um, about another minute to let more guests join us. Um, while we wait, it's always <laughs> fun to know where the audience is tuning in from. So please go ahead and open the chat, which you'll probably find at the bottom of your screen, and uh, drop us a note. Uh, let us know where you are today. Jeremy and I are, are surrounded by books that are about to drown us. It looks, <laughs> it looks rather precarious. <laughs> and Jeremy, I'm noticing all the papers to care of yours. Are those ILL books or are those your personal notes? Uh, some combination, but a lot of them just, yes, a lot of them are just, uh, they came from the library and maybe at some point to the library, they will return. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. I still have a few from more than a decade ago. Apologies to that library. No. Well, let's go ahead and get started now. Um, thank you all for joining us today for this very special installment of our Norton Library and Norton Critical Edition Speaker Series. My name is Megan Zwilling. I'm a proud member of the literature marketing team here at Norton. Uh, Jeremy was actually asking, this is my 12th year of Norton. It's a wonderful place to be and a wonderful place to write for and edit for. Uh, before we start, I do want to review a few housekeeping details. So we are recording this webinar. Um, so that way, my colleague, Rachel Goodman, can email it to all of you tomorrow so you can rewatch, share, we'll also be sending it to anyone who registered but was unable to attend live. Uh, Jared and Jeremy will talk for about 30 minutes, after which I'll come back on screen and moderate a Q&A with questions, hopefully, from all of you. Um, so your microphones are muted, but we really do want to hear from you. So use a chat function uh, at any time to communicate and comment. Use a Q&A function to submit any questions. Uh, you can submit them at any time during uh, the talk, um, and we will get to them. And you can also use the Q&A function to see questions that have been asked by um, others here. You can give them a thumbs up or even comment on them. It's helpful. That way, we know which questions you really want to know the answers to. If you need it, uh, we do have closed captioning functionality available. All you have to do is hit the closed captioning button on your screen. And so now the reason we're here today is my great honor to introduce our speakers. Professor Jared Gardner is Joseph V. Denny, designated professor of English at The Ohio State University. He's the editor of the Norton Critical Edition of A Contract with God and Other Stories of Dropsy Avenue. If you have not yet seen it, I think it's one of our most beautiful critical editions. We even have artwork stretching around to the back. Um, Jared's also the author of three monographs, co-editor of numerous volumes on topics in comic studies and history. And he has served as a curator for select exhibits at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. So Professor Jeremy Dauber is professor of Jewish literature and American studies at Columbia University. He's the author of numerous books, including the recently published American Comics and Jewish Comedy, a series history with Norton. And he has been a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award twice for his published works. With that, over to you, Jared and Jeremy. Thank you so much, Megan. And um, uh, I'm just so excited to be here, getting a chance to talk with Jeremy. And um, I thought I maybe just to kind of before we start going back and forth, just take a second for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with Will Eisner and his career, um, is to just very quickly put up a, 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 a slideshow um, of, um, it, this is about as, uh, about as uh, simple a slideshow as uh, one can do for a person with a very complicated and long career. Uh, but I wanted to kind of plugging into uh, Jeremy's book in particular, um, I wanted to think about, um, and hopefully you guys are seeing the full slide and not my, um, not my uh, kind of- We are I seeing the presenter view. <laughs> you are seeing the yeah, presenter Yeah, try hitting view. swap displays at the top. Usually that helps. I will do it. Thank you. Um, with two yep. screens, it's always it. impossible to tell. So um, Will Eisner um, is uh, really there at the very beginning of the comic book 
uh, industry, and uh, which and kind of shows up throughout Jeremy's book um, in in different roles. Um, he right out of high school, he's looking for work. He doesn't. He kind of starts working even while he's in finishing um, his third year in high school. Um, and a lot of his friends in high school are going to go on and become, along with him, some of the uh, important figures, actually, in the history of comics. Um, and early on, he starts hearing that a lot of his friends are getting work with um, a new magazine, a new comics magazine called Wow, What a Magazine, which is just awesome to say. You should try saying it yourself. Um, and it's really his first opportunity to see what this totally new industry might look like. Uh, the first monthly comic book has uh, been founded just literally a few weeks before in 1934. And um, everybody is kind of interested in what this might mean, but also eager to, you know, make sure they're kind of not going to get crushed in something that might disappear overnight. And I know we can talk more about that. Um, very quickly, Eisner um, comes up with, a, with an idea after the collapse of Wow, What a Magazine. And that's Eisner's cover art there on the left. Um, and begins uh, to work as the uh, co-owner um, and director, along with the uh, original editor of Wow, What a Magazine, Jerry Iger, of uh, a, a studio uh, that is dedicated to producing original art quickly, cheaply, efficiently for all these new comics publishers that are eager to get into comics, uh, don't want to have to license from the um, newspaper syndicates, which is very expensive, uh, looking for original work. There are lots of artists and writers who are out of work during the Depression, um, lots of very hungry young people like Will Eisner. Um, and Eisner decides to put his friends to work. Um, and uh, begins creating content for um, a range of comics publishers. Uh, you see Sheena down there in the lower left on the on the Jumbo Comics. It's one of his uh, many uh, creations during this period. Um, uh, the Hawks sees up above. That's all Will Eisner cover art as well. And Eisner writes about this much later um, in a book called Dreamer, where he kind of romanticizes this period of his life and writes about a particularly important story in 1939, when short, not that many years after the founding of this studio, um, he decides to sell off his share to his partner um, in order to try something radically new. His partner tells him, you're, you're crazy, you're a dreamer. Um, in real life, it was a little more contentious than that, but I like this, this softer, um, uh, friendlier version. Uh, and the new thing he decides to go on and do is, is create uh, a new kind of comic book, character in a new kind of comic, which is uh, The Spirit, um, one of the great comics of the 20th century, um, that is part of a, uh, a new idea that uh, he and a, a publisher named Busy Arnold, um, everybody had awesome names, and I refuse to use their given names. Only their nicknames should be used. Um, and they came up with this idea, or it was actually Arnold's idea, and Eisner got very excited by it, to create a, a, a newspaper supplement that would be a comic book. Instead of the traditional newspaper comic strips, this would be in comic book form. And the spirit uh, ran here in the uh, Tribune uh, syndicate um, for many years uh, and was... Um, uh, you know, never kind of, unfortunately, never set fire to a bunch of imitators within this new medium, but it remained popular and syndicated across 40 newspapers. Then he gets drafted and goes to um, serve in the army, uh, working as an artist, and quickly proves invaluable um, in creating um, a series of educational comics about proper maintenance of equipment, about uh, safety, um, this becomes something he becomes very passionate about, thinking about how comics can be used for education, and, and his service really becomes an opportunity to put that idea to the test. Um, he creates this character, Joe Dope, uh, don't be a dope, um, who does everything wrong in order to kind of provide negative uh, examples that are sometimes funny and sometimes quite gruesome, actually. There's quite a few decapitations in these. Um, after the war, um, he decides, he continues to work, he kind of takes over control of the spirit, 
Um, but by the early 50s, he's getting ready to wind that down. And he founds the American Visuals Corporation, which is uh, dedicated to basically taking what he's learned uh, during his service in World War II and making a company that's going to do educational comics and comics that are essentially kind of nonfiction comics um, for promotional purposes and educational purposes. Um, and he continues his work with the military for many years with Preventative Maintenance Monthly. Um, and really decides, you know what, this is where I'm going to work. Comic books remain mostly kid stuff. I thought with the spirit I could move comics in a more adult direction, but I'm not sure that's going to happen, so I'm going to stay here. And he really does stay there. I mean, he stays in touch with the world of comics, and he's very protective of the spirit, uh, but he kind of checks out of, of the comics business for a long time till he gets drawn in in the early 70s, um, into discovering kind of like Rip Van Winkle, what's happened while he was away. Um, and what happened while he was away is the underground comics movement, um, which shows him not the comics he wants to do. He has no interest in an acid trips, uh, but the possibilities now of actually reaching adult uh, readers and uh, stepping outside of the comics industry he knew. And this inspires him along with some personal events in his life at this time that kind of have him thinking back to his own past and to his recent past with the loss of his daughter uh, to write Contract with God um, uh, off the first, uh, not the first graphic novel or even the first person to use the term, but the first person to uh, use the, the term on the cover and to popularize the form. Uh, and he actively sought out, and I think this is very unique to him, getting into bookstores alongside people like uh, some of the American Jewish writers that he most admired, like Roth and Malamud and so on. Um, and uh, that really becomes, along with his educational work, his career for the next, uh, really for the rest of his life. Um, he continues to work in um, adult graphic novels uh, up through uh, the plot, The Secret Story of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which he publishes with Norton, his, his final publisher. Um, and um, that's kind of where we where we kind of pick up. Um, I think it's a it's a good place then to kind of turn over to Jeremy to tell us a little bit about what did Eisner miss while while he was away. Well, <laughs> uh, I you know I think that uh, you know Jared and I were talking. First of all, it's such a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's great talking with Jared. I think uh, you know um, projections is one of the greatest monographs uh, on comics. Uh, that anyone has written uh so it, it's really i've learned so much from it and from you so it's wonderful to be to be here and this is a great edition that jared has edited and i would say that even if an article of mine wasn't in it um it is it is just a wonderful thing and i encourage all of you who are listening if you're professors to use it in your class uh um and uh certainly to spread the word about it uh i i think that in terms of Eisner's legacy as we were discussing jared and i a little bit before this starts you know one of the interesting things is um this sense of paradox uh, that really sort of is it right here he is he's, he's sort of involved he's not involved um, he is a creature uh, of the depression who really wants to make comics into a business uh, and is so responsible for part of the uh, assembly line nature of com the early days of comics and then who says I hate all this and I don't want anything to do with it uh, uh, it has more ambitions than this he's a creature as Jared was pointing out really of the military industrial complex um, who is uh, 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 you know, idolized uh, by uh, the counterculture, uh, you know, at a time when, when you know, he ostensibly stands for everything uh, that he was standing for. Uh, and as we can get back to, uh, this is a different, a very different kind of paradox than those two, but is someone whose work um, is on the one hand, his late work is intensely autobiographical, but while without sharing one of the most important autobiographical touchstones uh, to the title story, which we, we, we've both danced around and we can get to. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and so one of the things that's sort of the most interesting from, you know, is, is are those paradoxes that we can get back to. In terms of, uh, you know, what he's, the last thing that I'll say is that uh, one of the things that this autobiography is interesting to me about uh, in the contract with God is that as Jared points out, it really comes out at a time when you have these other American Jewish writers on the bookstores and that they're getting credit in certain ways for the first time. When this book comes out, uh, 
uh, you know, the comics world, uh, certain things are beginning to happen. There's 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 you know ground level comics and what have you. But also, you know, two Jewish writers who live in America, Saul Bell and Isaac Bashevis Singer, have just received the Nobel Prize. Um, Irving Howe's World of Our Fathers has just become a bestseller and won the National Jewish Book Award. Uh, uh, the National Book Award, excuse me, not the National Jewish Book Award, if I remember all correctly. Um, uh, if I, I think I'm right about that, but some major award. Uh, and, you know, we have this real uh, uh, sense that to, to tell an American Jewish story, an American Jewish nostalgia story, is really at the heart of what American culture is. Uh, and yeah. so Eisner is both being kind of nostalgic, but also being right on time uh, in a way that he also manages to do at a lot of these different points in his career. So maybe those could be other ways that we're saying of what he misses. There's that backward looking, and there's also that sort of, you know, a uh, very contemporary sort of of the moment sense that Eisner always seems to be part of. Yeah, no, I think that's, and I think you're also pointing at something super important that I know you've you've kind of written about elsewhere, which is something I think, you know, young people and, and even young younger Jews don't always kind of fully realize, um, although they hear us, us old timers talk about it enough, <laughs> which is, um, you know, that the, you know, Today, I think the, you know, although it's getting a little, getting a little shaky out there, but today there's, you know, despite the rising tide of anti-Semitism, there is a, a kind of general sense that, you know, that Jewish Americans for the most part kind of present as white, have, have uh, many of the benefits uh, and privileges um, uh, uh, that kind of come with uh, in a, uh, in a racialist and racist society with presenting as white. But that wasn't always the case, um, you know. I think for um, in the you know for the period of Eisner's uh, uh, when his parents came over um, early in the century, um, and even when Eisner was growing up, uh, Jews were uh, visibly kind of marked out in a range of ways um, and uh, suffered incredible range of uh, anti-Semitism. I mean. Hitler was sending folks over here to learn how to be better anti-Semites. Uh, this we were doing it real well in the United States and kind of disavowed that. Right after World War II, there's this that wasn't us, that was them. And there's you know to kind of borrow from uh, a kind of concept that shows up sometimes in whiteness studies, the Jews become white, but also the quintessential immigrant story. Right, this is the the story of how how kind of Jews go through this, this story that then gets kind of repeated, even though, of course, there had been many other immigrant groups alongside the Jews. But they become, in the wake of World War II, opportunities for, for Jews to tell their stories, to be embraced by cultures mm -hmm. outside of Jewish culture, really explode um, for a, a good period. Um, and there's, there's opportunities to tell the, the Shoah story, which is so crucial. Um, and of course, um, ultimately, um, you know, we find uh, that the stories and, and Jewish literature and, and the stories of Jewish experience in America and in Europe becomes even canonical to the curriculum. Um, and, you know, my kids certainly grew up with those stories. But I, that's not, that's a pretty recent invention at the time Eisner's coming kind of to the graphic novel. And I think he's very excited by the possibilities of telling stories he thought he could never tell. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, Irving Howe, who I just mentioned uh, yeah. before, really said at that point, and I think this is what you're, also what you're saying, that this was what the American Jewish story was. That American Jewish literature, in fact, his argument was, which I think has been proven wrong, but that was his argument at the time, was going to come to an end because it really was the story of this group of people who are Eisner's parents and Eisner coming, becoming American, whatever that means, right? That may mean in this case also something like becoming white, right? right. And making it, right? To use another right. famous title from the period, right? And Eisner was someone who over the, this period that Jared sort of uh, delineated so wonderfully in the slideshow, this is what Eisner did. He became, a, and he could tell that story. And it was a story that had a certain kind of get the other thing that gets back to it is that it is a story that, is, as Jared's pointing out, I think quite correctly, you know, is part of the history of comic books, which is based uh, certainly in Eisner's view, but I think correctly, uh, on uh, workplace discrimination against Jews. Yeah. Um, that was why, I mean, Eisner, if you read Eisner's interviews, as Jared has, but everyone, uh, you know, with Frank Miller, he very explicitly states, why did we go into comics? Because it was a crap medium, and that's why Jews could go, go into yeah. it. Right. Same, re and, same reason Jews went into the film industry at its origins, right? 
yeah. there's nobody here to keep us out. So let's 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 make a business out of it. Yeah. And it's funny because this is a period of time when, you know, everybody in America is reading comics, right? Everybody in America is reading comic strips, right? But that's not a really very Jewish medium. Um, but the comic books, uh, you could you could do this, right, as, 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 as you're saying. And, and at the same time, Eisner is in it. He, as a depression kid, he wants to make that money. He wants to have a sort of success out of it. But it's not enough for him also. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I do think it's, I think you get at something else that I think is worth touching on, right? Eisner is, if, if, if Howe was right, and this is just ultimately an assimilation narrative and the, the, the Jews become quote unquote white, we wouldn't have the Jewish American literature we have, right? Which is often about the, the limits of this fantasy of assimilation. Um, and Eisner's own story is a, a, a guy who kind of drifted away from um, Judaism culturally and and spiritually and actually suddenly comes back to it, right? This is really becomes one of his dominant topics, as well as the story of the 1930s in New York, which um, he spends a lot of time kind of thinking about and, and, and drawing about. Um, but it's kind of interesting that this guy's made it. If that was really the the end point of all of this, um, he could have sailed off into the military industrial complex. But in fact, he goes back to his roots. He goes back to the to the Bronx tenements. Um, and we see that story playing out in a lot of the Jewish American literature that he really admired, too. Right. That you think the younger generation thinks they can step away. But um, and I think he's interested in that as well. What is the pull um, and what does that part of his identity um, have to teach him in his in his later years. I think that's right. I mean, and I think that, you know, one of the interesting things is you said, what did he miss? Um, what was one of your first, right, was, uh, as we, we were sort of alluded to, well, in some ways he missed sort of that autobiographical turn of the underground. Right. Um, and so, you know, you have that sense of what is that story? Now, at that particular point, sort of that younger, for him, younger generation, that autobiographical turn was frequently, although not always, about trauma. Um, yeah. Right, whether it was Pinky Brown or whether it was you know the Proto Mouse that wasn't out yet, but but uh, but the first the first little four page version was out. Yeah. The first little four page version was out exactly. Yeah. You know, and so on the one hand he he's drawn to that aspect of this, and on the other hand you know this is the guy who wrote a Life Force and the Dreamer um, and loves myth uh, right. as well, and it's like and how does he do? Is that he turns his own trauma into myth into a contract right. with God uh, and something that can ultimately be cyclical, right? That's how the whole contract with God thing starts again at that at the end. And I think yeah. those are the, another of those tensions, his sort of optimistic sense versus that sense of what do you need to write an autobiographical story? What was it like back then? And, we're and, 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 and the need, his need at that moment, even as he's wrestling with um, the, I mean, the, the loss of his daughter to leukemia was clearly the most kind of tra traumatic and heartbreaking uh, part of his life. And it marks a real real shift in the life of the family um, and in his own work. And clearly the contract with God story, the first story in this volume and the first story in the uh, original um, volume from 78 of Contract with God is clearly on one hand, the story of the loss of his daughter, but it's told from the perspective of um, a both of somebody from the past and somebody whose relationship to their Judaism is very different than what he grew up with in a, you know, in a, in a largely secular Jewish house or, you know, relatively secular for uh, compared to the, the kind of Hasidic community that is, is represented at, at times in uh, contract with God. And, you know, I think part of what for me makes Eisner so fascinating, I mean, there's so much that makes him so fascinating, but it is those paradoxes you're getting at, mm. that, that he was aware of them, like he was, he was <laughs> very aware that he is torn between different impulses, right, the businessman and the artist, um, and he would often kind of allegorize those two parts of his personality with his parents. Like, you know, my dad was the dreamer. Uh, my mom was the was the hard nosed pragmatist. Um, and, you know, I think I'm sure, you know, uh, that there was a lot to that. Um, but, you know, I think he struggled with it. I think it wasn't always easy for him to, you know, if he was um, kind of doing one thing, he always felt the call or the pull, I should be doing the other thing. And, um, you know, I think there was a way in which for all of his frustrations with the comic book industry, which I'm sure were real, he also knew that, you know, especially after the spirit, he could have gone back and, 
done his own thing. I think he really found it stressful and actually stepping away into the world of his own little business that was quite, you know, quite successful um, and not thinking about that larger work of the possibilities of comics and uh, just not hearing all those competing voices gave him a chance to focus on his family, on his kids. It was really what he needed to do. And um, he knew that if he was immersed in that comics industry, it would be really hard. He would not give his kids the time he wanted to. Um, he wanted to be, a, for a while at least, a nine to fiver, but that ends with, with the loss of his daughter and with the discovery of uh, what's been happening in underground comics. And I think you're right, it really is. I've never found evidence that he saw the original mouse or saw Binky Brown at that time when he first gets introduced to underground comics by Dennis Kitchen. But it's hard to imagine that he would, right? It's hard to imagine yeah. if not, certainly before he starts working on Contract with God in earnest, he's somebody has put that before him. And those are really the beginning of uh, American autobiographical comics, both of them published in 1972, right around the time he's really kind of starting to dive into this material. Um, and, uh, you know, I also could point to the Goldie stories by Aline yeah. Um, And really, you know, as we look now and see how much graphic memoir is so central to uh, what we call the graphic novel, even though so many of them are, uh, so many of our most canonical graphic novels are in fact, um, uh, autobiographical or semi-autobiographical. Um, I mean, that was really the part of, I think, the underground movement that really made everything fire off for him. Not the not the the kind of free to be you and me hippie stuff, which I think he had little interest in. Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, I, I think that, you know, I keep thinking as you're talking, Jared, of that famous cover that he did for Snarf, um, where and and you know with one of the, for the one of these underground or sort of underground comics. And what's interesting about it is, uh, I, I wish I had it to throw up on the screen, which I don't. But is the composition of it, which gets exactly to what you're saying, where Eisner draws the spirit and Commissioner Dolan, these two characters from the spirit, looking in at this kind of hippie scene, right? right? And like he's not on the one hand, they're not in it, right? They're looking right. at it, right? But they're also in it because he's drawn the whole thing, right? Yeah, um, and their and their response to it. I mean. Dolan's maybe a little more <laughs> skeptical, but you know, the spirit is, he's like, he looks like he might be open to it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, um, there's a wonderful little cartoon that Dennis Kitchen did um, a little bit, you know, after the event, but of him and Eisner, him telling Eisner all about kind of underground comics and Eisner's there with a pipe looking like, huh, huh. And it's just such a great, you know, cause they really was a huge generational difference. Um, you know, and I think the importance of Dennis Kitchen in this story, both as, as a kind of ongoing caretaker of, of so much of his work and um, and somebody who really developed a crucial partnership with Eisner as he's making this transition, you know, shouldn't be underestimated because I think a lot of folks of his generation would have said, look at this square old dude. And, uh, and you know, but I think he wasn't alone. As you said, a lot of the underground cartoonists really thought of, of Eisner despite his, you know, not being part of that scene at all. Um, as a kind of kind of spiritual godfather for what they were doing. Do you have a sense of why that is? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, part of it gets back to what you were saying, which is that he um, he seems to have been the one who uh, uh, expressed these ambitions for comics that were kind of beyond what what other people. Yeah. Had. I think in some ways, you know, aesthetically, if you were able to get your hands it's much easier now than then on an Eisner page, uh, splash page from the spirit. You said something else is kind of going on here. Right. Um, and I do think that if you read some of those Eisner, I mean, you, know, you, you hear some of the underground people talking about something like Gerhard Schnabel or something like that. And they say, wait a minute, you know, this is a guy who also, he knows the conventions and he subverts them and he twists right. them. Not in the way that the other godfather from that pipe smoking godfather from that older generation Kurtzman did. Right. Not for laughs, yeah. but saying, or not quite for laughs. But saying, I, I, I get it, I get what you're doing, and I'm going to turn it upside down. And I think that that uh, appealed to that counterculture. I, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Kurtzman always made much more sense, right? Kurtzman <laughs> dives into you know, like his own version of a middle-aged counterculture early and, you know, with Help Magazine and, uh, and others. Um, Eisner, you know, really was... Um, uh, he was a family man and a businessman. Uh, but I think you're right. It's in the art. Um, I think it's a lot of it more than even the the writing, although, you know, the 
there was a really heavy embrace of the spirit um, by there was and part of what Eisner did the one thing he stayed connected with in the comics industry in the kind of later 50s and 60s was just being a caretaker of the spirit um, keeping it uh, there were reprints there were uh, that was the one work from his comic book days that he was proud to own and he and he literally did own it um, carefully negotiated uh, again the businessman and Eisner yeah. uh, carefully worked out with uh, with busy Arnold um, and um, he you know he he knew there was something there I think he must have sensed this maybe this was a little ahead of its time and maybe the next generation will get it and they did I mean he continues in the 70s some with different publishers, um, including Kitchen, to do reprints of uh, the spirit. And those actually become the places where he starts serializing some of his graphic narrative stories as well. And it's a place where he can also interact in the letters pages with this new younger audience. Yes. And, uh, and I think, you know, he's fired up as anybody would be who's been away from the business for so long and come back fired up to see, hey, my work is actually connecting more now than it might have done then. That's right. And I will say, and I see Megan, but I will say one, one other thing, if I can, if I can um, which is to say that, you know, we talked in a previous conversation, Jared, you and I, about all the people who were affiliated with Eisner, who he's right. right. And I just want to put Jules Pfeiffer's name into the mix, Absolutely. not just as a, as a student and as a bohemian, right, but also as the creator of the great comic book heroes book, um, yeah. which was one of those few books that if you were a comics fan, you could get your hands on and you know this was a character who in that book felt a little different from all of the other characters that are in that book um and and so i think if you were you know you could get a, a sense there that this was an icon that was a little different that's all I want yeah to say. and pfeiffer is a good transitional kind of figure for between that world where he worked with the spirit studio and the world of underground comics um yeah they picked some good role models those <laughs> <laughs> absolutely Great. Well, Jared, you had just mentioned uh, about a minute ago, Eisner interacting with his audience. So I felt that was a good transition uh, to the two of you interacting with ours. Uh, before we do, uh, Jeremy, I love that Snarf cover. So I went ahead and pulled oh. it up here uh, to share with our audience. <laughs> And uh, uh, how did you phrase it, Jared? The uh, I think the nonsense? spirit the spirit looks like I'm I'm maybe want to go join them, right? He's got one foot going through the door, through the frame, quite literally. Um, you know, Dolan, um, his boss is obviously his impulse is to arrest him, but the spirit is thinking, I might, I might like to hang out with these kids. Um, but he looks a little scared too. Yeah. I, there's, definitely, there's a little ambivalence there. He looks a little intimidated. So yeah. what, like me walking into a party with a lot of younger Gen Zers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. And I will say that I love this on the right, this you're beginning to show establishment tendencies, right? I mean, that shows it all in terms of what we're saying about you know, this convergence kind of question. Um, yeah, and I do think he's also making fun of underground comics too here, right? He says, after Crumb, what is there left to say? Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I, I mean, Eisner surely admired Crumb um, as, a, as an artist, but um, part of his work is as a response to that question, right? Oh, there's a lot to say <laughs> after Crumb, right? There's, you know, there is so much to say. And um, I think he really wanted to kind of be an answer for that particular question as he moved forward. Yeah, I right. think that's absolutely right. Well, let's hop now into our Q&A. Um, first question is, what was the initial reception of A Contract with God and just educational comics in general during Eisner's time? That's a great question. And actually, you know, one of the things I really admire, I mean, there's so much I admire about Eisner, but you know, one of the things I admire is um, he put he put his money where his mouth is. So he's publishing with a very small, tiny little publisher called Baronet that's actually on its last legs. Um, they are very excited about the book, but they're not sure that they can sustain the risk of it. And he puts his own money into it um, to prop up the press. Uh, it does not last for too much longer. Um, and it is not a huge success. Um, it's, you know, the biggest challenge is in 78, we have shifted by now from the kind of newsstand market for comics into the comic stores. Um, and that is a space and a place where I think Eisner could have found uh, 
a really welcoming audience, but he's really wants to be in bookstores. Like that is super important to him. It's way ahead of its time. I mean, comics and bookstores is obviously very much a thing, but I can remember even coming to Columbus in the late nineties and going to Barnes and Noble and asking where the comic section was and getting a skeptical look like that's not, that's not what we do here. Now, of course, it's about all they do. Um, and so, you know, he was taking risks. He knew they were risks. He knew this was labor of love. And he's continuing to do commercial projects, including a series of kind of funny uh, books that he's publishing himself, um, kind of mad magazine style books to kind of keep it going. Because he knows eventually this is going to catch on and it will with the reprint. But the first edition, um, you know, definitely found some people who some critics who recognized it right away for its importance, but it just wasn't reaching the readers it needed to reach. Yeah. Uh, in terms of educational comics, the, the army was skeptical at first, right? The army was like, what? The, why are we doing comics? This is serious stuff. Um, but they did a test and they put their traditional manuals next to Eisner's comics versions of the same information. And Eisner's comics version resulted in so much better retention and reading that the army was like we're in like they it was just the facts right but they were they were sold um his business did well it never kind of exploded but it was really solid uh, and um and he was an artist and a writer in a lot of the early stuff as well I just want to say, and I want to say, uh, I make no money from this Norton Critical Edition. You should all know that in advance. But, but that uh, Jared has done a great job of assembling some early responses to a contract we've got in the Critical Edition in the back. And I remember from doing my work on my own book, one of the things, because I didn't have this, but I, what I found in the Comics Journal, um, that Denny O'Neill uh, review uh, of him, which is right at the time, it was in, sort of adapted into an introduction to the, to the graphic novel later on. Um, and basically what he says there, just to build out what Jared was saying, right, is O'Neill says, and, and for those of you who don't know, Denny O'Neill, a major, major creative force as writer and editor for DC and Marvel mostly. Um, uh, uh, but he says, basically what I was going to do before I wrote, I, I read it was I, I thought I would hate it. I thought this would be terrible. Um, and I was just going to just spend my time writing about how wonderful Will Eisner was and kind of avoid the actual work. Um, but he says, you know, I was wrong. This really is a remarkable achievement. You're not going to really understand it until you see it, but you should see it. So, you know, there's that aspect to it that, uh, as Jared was saying, a couple of people got it, um, but just because a couple of people got it didn't mean that it was a success, which, you know, commercially or anything like that. And a lot of people wanted the spirit. I mean, like yeah. he had been, he had been associated with the spirit for so long that people had a hard time kind of fully accepting him, especially as an older cartoonist. Um, it's amazing that his career will go on so long after this, but, you know, in for uh, the, the very heavily youth culture, youth oriented culture of the 70s, uh, this was a, you know, a, a kind of grand old uh, establishment figure. Um, and a lot of people wrote in even to his magazine, like, I want you to do more spirit, less of this. Um, and I think he expected that. Like, I think he, he knew it was going to take time and he had the patience for it. And that's part of what comes with maturity. It's like, I'm not going to just walk away, and um, and we're grateful that he didn't. That's true. Yeah, exactly. All right. Our next question comes from our editor of the Norton Critical Editions, Carol Bemis. Hi, Carol. Carol. <laughs> um, Carol's question is one I'm also really curious about. She says, as scholars and authors of the graphic no novel genre, are there any thoughts you would, either or both, like to share about the forthcoming Broadway musical production of A Contract with God? <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, when I first heard about it, which I think, I think I actually heard about it through uh, Carol from the family, um, right as we were kind of getting close to production. And, you know, I used to be one of those people to be like a Broadway musical, a musical based on a comic. That's crazy talk. And, you know, then, of course, you know, the incredibly magical uh, uh theatrical adaptation of, of Fun Home came out. And I was like, all right, I, once again, I'm wrong. I also said the iPhone was going to be a failure. So <laughs> once again, don't don't invest based on my uh, advice. So, so now I'm very excited about it. I think, you know, one of the reasons I think it might work really well, one of the reasons I'm really optimistic about it is because if, even though this is many decades later, 
this book and a lot of life of Eisner's later work really contains a lot of theater in them. There's a lot of interest in theatrical gestures and staging and lighting. I think things, I mean, I really, other critics have said it and I, I you know, I agree. Um, I, I've become more convinced as I've gone forward that like a lot of this, a lot of his visual sensibility was learned hanging out in the, in the Yiddish theater um, as a, a kid and a teenager. Um, his father did scene painting there for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, he loved the theater and the theater was, the Yiddish theater was incredibly exciting, dynamic space uh, at the time he was coming of age. Um, uh, some real masterpieces that he would have seen. And I just feel like he's, even as he's going back to his childhood and thinking back to the thirties, he's also recapturing a lot of his interest in the theater, which he couldn't really have explored as much in certainly in superhero comics. Some of it certainly works its way into the spirit for sure. But uh, Contract with God, especially the first story and many of um, the stories, the other dropsy stories that are collected in this volume really do have a theatrical feel to it. So I'm, I'm very excited. I hope it captures some of that uh, Yiddish, the, the lost Yiddish theater um, that I, I, I was born too late to experience, um, although there were revivals of it in my youth. Uh, yeah, I think that's I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I haven't seen any any of the materials related to it, but uh, fun, you know, fun home was also a revelatory experience for me. And I think that, uh, you know, as a historical note, I think Jared is, is, of course, exactly right that we almost don't recognize how central the theater was to those 30s kids uh, and to the culture as a whole. Um, now, because you know we've gone through so many different iterations of other mass media becoming central. But you even think about a movie, a movie from twenty years after or fifteen years after that, all about Eve, right? Where it's right. still the center of the story is what do you do in the theater? Um, and 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 so I think that there is that theatrical magic uh, 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 there, and I, I I don't have any reason to think that they won't capitalize on it. Um, yeah, so no, I, I I think I'm I'm excited um, and. There's a lot of music in Eisner too. So um, sometimes literal and sometimes just in, and he talks about it in his own writing about making comics, that kind of thinking about rhythm, thinking about musicality. So I, I think I'm, I'm, I'll be, I'll be, well, not first in line probably, but I'll be there. Um, yeah, and it's bound to be better than the Spider-Man musical. I, you know, I never saw it, but I never heard one good thing about it. <laughs> I kind of wanted to see it just for the, the horror show of it. But yeah, yeah. no, it will for sure. Our next question uh, asks, you know, as someone less familiar with Eisner, how does the spirit fit in with the idea that Eisner's later work revolves around his Judaism? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jeremy here, but I think it's, I think one of the frustrations that's actually growing for him a bit around that time, particularly around the time is, is that he can't really, again, part, part of it is that he still has that sense that, um, you know, Judaism is something that can make one vulnerable to profound discriminations um, and, and, you know, hurt his family, right? And so it's not something he feels that he can foreground in his work. I think we can find it allegorized, but, but rarely, if ever, foregrounded in the spirit. Is that your sense, Jeremy? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, one of the, the things that I found so interesting is that comment by Jules Pfeiffer in that uh, introduction to the uh, great comic book heroes, that's something like, we all knew the spirit was Jewish, right? I, and I was like, really? I don't know. That there's a lot of is. shrugging, a lot of hands, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, the, the, certainly the physical gestures, I was like, yeah, it's, that's, those, are our, those are our guys. I think it's interesting, right? Because on the one hand, you know, I, I talk about this all the time in the Jewish comedy world of what I do, where Jack Benny, um, who is roughly of the period of the spirit, was right. the most popular comedian, the most popular radio voice in the right? Um, and the question was, everybody who was Jewish knew that Jack Benny was right. Jewish. And nobody, basically, who wasn't Jewish thought that Jack Benny was Jewish. And so I think a lot of this, and this is, uh, you know, one of these things that I think both of us, all of us maybe see when we look at some of these characters, whether they be Superman or what have you, is, you know, for one constituency, uh, it's it's very clear to them that it's one interpretation. And for another constituency, it's, it's not clear at all, which is just a way of saying that right. this stuff is rich enough that it can support these these multiple uh readings so i yeah I, yeah so i, I was thinking about how like in the 60s and 70s you know everybody 
everybody in New York who I knew who who was was gay knew Rock Hudson was gay, but uh -huh. nobody else, and you know, until the end of his life, you know, knew it. Right? There's a way in which right. I think folks know things because they can, and and especially at a time when popular culture, and it still does, but much less than it used to, when popular culture did not tell the stories of gays and lesbians in America, of Jews, yeah. of African Americans, there often was a way of looking for um, hidden signs, clues, winks and nods that allowed one to identify and claim that culture, uh, that popular culture for uh, themselves. This became a big issue, for example, in the, the huge backlash against the comic book uh, and the, that gave rise to the comic book code in the, in the early 50s. Um, because a lot of young um, uh, gay teens had kind of, you know, I think not shockingly to retrospective eyes, recognized that even though obviously Batman and Robin were not intended to be uh, a, a same-sex couple, it's about as close as you're going to get in popular culture, right? So that's the great thing about being a fan is, you know, we see this with fan fiction is that you can imaginatively um, kind of read more into certain elements and make it your own. In the case of Jewish comics, everybody knew the Jews had founded this industry. It was part of why the industry was kind of reviled for a long time, right? It was that there was kind of considered kind of trashy, all these pornographers and, and folks who are kind of came from unseemly backgrounds. So that was an open secret. And so it became something that I think, as you said, Jews growing up, knew to look for little signs of, of Jewish life and, and attitudes in comics that presented very much and often as non-Jewish. I mean, who is the first Jewish superhero? Is, I mean, I always think Ben Grimm. Um, but I think that's be, a ret, I mean, that's a ret, you know, that's a retcon. I think you're that's right. That's a retcon too. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of uh, the desire to kind of acknowledge at last the Jewishness of of so many of these characters in terms of their creation yeah. uh, and their creators, but that's much later. Yeah, and I and and you know I think you know you have a lot of people say, well, of course it was Kirby, and of course it was you know Yan, you know the Lower East Side, and everything. And on some level, I think that's right. And on some level, if you were a kid, and I was a you know a Jewish kid growing up, wanting to find Jewishness everywhere, and I had no idea. Uh, until later on, right? But yeah. as you say, Jared, and I think Jared's so right about this, that, you know, you have all of these sort of young black readers saying, the X-Men are us, we're the right. X-Men, right? And the X-Men, you know, yes and no, right? I mean, but also yes. And yeah. that became hugely, hugely important about and, how to and, read, read Right, yourself. and they eventually realized, hey, you know, minoritized readers are seeing themselves in the X-Men X-Men can be a really powerful allegory. And that became something that becomes to be, especially in the Claremont era, begins to be done deliberately. But, you know, it was the fact that it was created, you know, by, you know, Lee and Kirby, two uh, Jews who had also changed their names, right, who are living in that world where a Jewish name could be a, a reason to lose a job, for example, um, or, you know, not get a dinner reservation. Um, they created the character and in some ways unconsciously built that allegory into it. The idea that you can't talk about the challenges of a neurotic Jewish family. So you create, um, you know, one of them will be retroactively uh, identified as Jewish, but you create a kind of uh, average American by which, you know, was meant at the time, you know, um, Protestant, white um, in mainstream popular culture. And, um, and then you leave that stuff kind of in the background, right? They're, they're almost writing a kind of secondary narrative for themselves. And I think Eisner was doing that too, um, but it wasn't enough for him. And I think that's ultimately why he, he moves on. That's right. Our next question asks if he could talk a little more, not about protographic novels like Topher or Mansoreel, but what the graphic novel looked like in this period. Um, you mentioned that it existed before Eisner used it as a marketing term, and I'm struck by the idea that the genre wasn't so much invented as arose naturally in the comic scene. Yeah, no, I, th I mean, part of it is, you know, when people ask me, you know, what's the difference between a graphic novel and a comic? On one level, it's marketing, and Eisner got that, right? I want this to be in different kinds of stores. I want people who would never pick up something called comic to pick this up. Got to change the name. And uh, that becomes a really powerful tool, right? I mean, 
comics ability to get out of the comic book stores and into the hands of people. Um, you know, more and more of my students come to comics through a first encounter with the graphic novel. Um, than they do through superheroes now. They, they may be watching the movies, but they're not reading the superhero comics. Um, and so we, we can see that marketing tool has been successful. But there's been lots of great work um, about kind of how we also need to recognize that, it, as you put it really nicely there, it's bubbling up out of the, the experiments. Once you don't, once you're self-publishing or publishing with, with small independent partners, once you're able to sell things in comic book stores and not have to deal with the comics code, the possibilities become pretty quickly endless. At first, underground comics were very much traditional, what, what the kids today call floppies. Um, it still hurts me when they say it, but it's but I use it too now sometimes. Um, but um, you know, there there are ambitious experiments that are happening kind of as Eisner is starting to experiment with this idea, starting to think through the idea of this long form semi-autobiographical work and later more explicitly autobiographical work. Um, and um, a few of them even use terms like picto novel and there's lots of different attempts to try it. And there are people theorizing it in some of the, the kind of fanzines and, uh, and, and kind of publications about comics and its possibilities. Um, uh, First Kingdom and, is, uh, and uh, Katz and Eisner, uh, corresponded a lot, uh, and and Katz called his big serial production a graphic novel too. So people were using the term for very different things, but what they really meant is, this is not that, right? It really kind of meant more than even long form. I mean, Eisner's first graphic novel is a collection of stories. Right. Um, the majority of the early graphic novels, including Mouse, were not novels. Um, so that term had more to do with ambition, I think, for retail space, for readers, for uh, a kind of literary ambition that is underwriting these graphic novels more than a particular size or shape. But in order to get in bookstores, you also have to start making things that will be able to be put on bookstore shelves. And so the, the physical shape of the graphic novel is something Eisner imagined and got Baronet to do very well. Um, and he was right on the money in imagining what this graphic novel form would have to look like in the stores to function. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to add much at all to that. I think Jared has put it very, right, that, that right, popping up in all these different kind of directions. Um, but the, this harnessing of the format, um, the, the venue, and the ambition. I mean, Byron Price's sort of science fiction packaging, or the, yeah. you know, that's one kind of thing, right? But it's not the ambition, right? It might have been in a book, right? And, and, and so you have all of these different kind of things that everybody is looking at from a technical side, from an ambition side, and Eisner somehow was putting this all together. And as we were saying before, in a way that wasn't really quite successful on right. all fronts, except for the aesthetic. Um, you know, and, and it, it's, uh, it's only later on that we're kind of retrospectively trying to put order onto the chaos. And that's part of the fun of uh, what we do is trying to say, let's sort of uh, embrace it in its mess uh, and then try and tell the story of how that, you know, people sort of seized on that mess in different ways. And yeah, and again, I think, you know, I, I, I never will ever take anything away from Eisner, but I sometimes think we're, we're doing a disservice to him when we um, insist on his firstness here. Yeah. Because I think his genius is his ability to float above all the incredible experiments and a little bit like the spirit in that 72 snarf there, um, just be like, what can I learn from all this? But I'm going to do something these kids are not old enough to even be thinking about. Like he knows that he's on a, he's, he's got ambitions. They're not reading, you know, Malamud and, and, uh, and company there. That, that's, that's where his ambitions lie. They have their own. Right. I think, I think it's a great way of putting it. I mean, you know, there's an old saying that in Hollywood, nobody wants to be first and everybody wants to be second. Um, and in many ways, Eisner wasn't quite first on almost anything, but he was the best second uh, yeah. in the business. Uh, uh, and yeah. that's not nothing at all. Everybody wants to no. be that, right? So. So our next question asks, what is your take on the advocacy turn of Eisner at the end of his life with Fagin the Jew and the plot? That's a great question. I'll let Jeremy, you want to go first there? I'll, I'll go. Okay, sure. I'll go. I'll, I'll go yeah. first. I actually, uh, if and here I will plug myself slightly, but only slightly because I still don't get paid. Um, 
my the article that I write that's included in here sort of talks about this a little. And my argument is a little bit maybe uh, what might, might not be expected, which is to say that I think this is his way of also dealing with the increasing guilt and confrontation that he felt about visual stereotyping uh, in his own yeah. early work, particularly about this ebony white character who really yeah. was not a great character in certain, you know, in, in terms of sort of a minstrel type character, yeah. particularly at the beginning. Um, and that really, that, that kind of soul searching when he realized, you know, uh, for a while, he, in decades earlier, he was more defensive and then he became less defensive about it. And he said, you know, visual stereotyping, and, and, and this is something Jared brought up in a previous conversation that we haven't gotten to, when he was teaching, and he was a huge educator in comics as well, um, on the one hand, it's at the heart of comics, is this visual shorthand. Yep. And on the other hand, it, 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 it uh, uh, deepens certain kinds of stereotypes. Uh, and how do we work with that? And Fagin the Jew, I think, really comes out of that in a lot of ways. What, what, what are we doing when we're sort of particularly illustrating Oliver Twist and we're illustrating Fagin? Uh, and then others, and, and then, you know, from there, it's only one step to some of the most pernicious stereotyping uh, right. that has ever existed. And that became, so that's, I think, only one aspect of it. But I think that's an important aspect because so much of his own work is not just about, uh, you know, trading on this stuff, but about w in what ways is that an inherent part of, of the comics business, of the comics medium? Yeah. So, and, and, you know, the term stereotype, which is itself a printer's term, right, which refers to the kind of ability to imprint an image or text over and over again very quickly, that has, you know, as it kind of moves over into its usage today, um, the kind of recognition that that repeated imprinting can have incredibly long lasting disastrous effects on a culture. And he, I mean, I, one of the things, again, another thing I really admire about him is that as, as an older man by this point, kind of recognized as the kind of, um, you know, the you know the most important figure in, and he really was well lauded at the end of his career as he should have been in American comics. He could have just walked away from those critiques that a lot of people were bringing towards the end of his life, and he didn't. Like he wanted to think through it from all angles. He wanted to, and I think I really that's part of why I wanted Jeremy to respond is I really think that's right. I also think with his very last book. Um, uh, the elders of Zion, um, you know, I think he was very concerned that a younger generation of Jews in particular and Americans more generally thought all of that kind of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory stuff was in the past. He was right. It's not right. We're very aware of that. We're seeing QAnon recycling the protocols. We're seeing the incredible resurgence of uh, the stuff that was part of daily life for Eisner and his friends growing up. Um, I think he was worried, you know, we, we, he knew the Holocaust story was well told, um, including by Art Spiegelman. Um, but I think he worried that the kind of blood libel myths, um, we were not aware of how pernicious and long lasting they were. Does that seem right to you, Jeremy? I think it does. I mean, and, and uh, you know, as, as, as Jared knows, and some of you who are out there who are scholars and have read the plot, uh, no, also, you know, there's this light motif in that book where it's like, okay, well, now we've proven that it's a forgery and no one will ever read this again. Uh, and then it, you know, goes back. And that's exactly what Jared is saying. You know, um, these things don't, they need constant effort uh, of the kind that Eisner really did. Like, like, uh, you know, Jared keeps coming back to correctly. You know, he didn't rest on his laurels. He didn't say, well, it's over. I, I can rest. I'm going to keep pushing. So I think that's a hundred percent right. Well, our last question, which I think is a great one to end on, um, starts actually with a really great um, perspective. Um, and that is Eisner gave voice to the Jewish experience, presented real life stories about immigrants and New York City people. By sharing his personal perspective through his work, Eisner created a blueprint for autobiographical comics. And then the question is, beyond his impact on the 60s underground generation, where do you see his work resounding in contemporary comics? Oh, that's a great question. I think it's an excellent question. There was a period, um, and I, I, I wanted to give voice to this because part of a Norton Critical Edition is 
is not hagiography. You also want to have the, the kind of critical voices and the opposition, because that's so productive for classroom discussion. Um, and I think just for readers generally, there was a period in the 90s when the alternative comic scene kind of graphic novel was really exploding, where there was a bit of a pushback against Eisner. Um, Eisner wasn't cool because he was so emotional, because his stuff was so theatrical. And this was a period of, you know, ghost world and uh, and kind of cool, like, you know, detached on we, um, I'm being, you know, painting with a very broad brush here, but um, there was a kind of, you know, end of the 90s sense of detachment and, uh, and that Eisner was the opposite of, right? Eisner, everything is huge and, and vital. Um, and I think there was a period where I think it's a lost opportunity where at the moment that it's really going mainstream as a form at the kind of end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st, I think there's a sense that I kind of wish Eisner had been more in front of these cartoonists. Uh, but I can, I know for sure, I know 100% that even a lot of those who didn't know Eisner when they first got started have come to Eisner later. Um, and his ongoing influence, he's often, I think, the, the, the cartoonist who folks who have, let's say, published their first book or finished their worst form book, then go and read. And they're like, whoa, I didn't know I could do emotions or really kind of personal stuff. And that influence is never going to go away. Eisner is, I mean, I teach in the Eisner seminar room. Um, and, um, you know, he is, most of the students in that class hadn't read a lot of Eisner when they walked in there, but their sense that, oh, wait, I need to read Eisner. And they have those revelations. I think that's going to be Eisner's role for this next generation is everybody is aware of how important Eisner is. I'm hoping we can get Eisner in front of more readers and more future cartoonists earlier, um, because I know a lot of cartoonists who regret not having been exposed both to the artist and the writer earlier in their career. And to remember that comics and emotions are, you know, they really do work well together. And we don't need to be afraid of allowing comics to express really powerful emotions of, of love and lust and hate and despair. And Eisner, you know, really believed that next to the theater, comics was the best medium to express the full range of human emotions. I, I think uh, that is a great place to leave it. I think, yeah, who can do better than that? So I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're at, we're after time. So I think that's that's. Yeah. Well, Jeremy, Jared, and all of you out there, thank you so much for joining us for this really exciting hour. Um, I learned a lot, really appreciated all of your comments and all of your insight. So uh, tomorrow, expect an email from my colleague, Rachel Goodman. That email will have a link to the recording of this event, as well as a survey where she's going to just look for a little bit of feedback from you. You can also ask Rachel for a copy of the Norton Critical Edition that we've talked about so much uh, during this hour. It really is a wonderful one. And with that, um, I hope you have a wonderful end of your day. Oh, yes. <laughs> We can't give away Jeremy's book. No, no, no. That was a, that was this one's. <laughs> but that's one a that big. you should look for. Uh, and it's on your now own. out in paperback. I will say that. Oh, so it is yes. awesome. Yes, that's great. Get it into the <laughs> that's classroom. That's when you know it's a success when we put it out in paperback. Hey, and thank you all for great questions yeah. too. That yes. was wonderful. Thank you. Well, enjoy the rest of your days, and I hope you have a great weekend ahead too. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye.